Katie, you know, Luke's absolutely right on this issue of people not feeling like their voices are being heard. And, and whether they disagree or not, and we've all been at barbecues where people will take different positions on issues, at least it's thrashed out and, and you know, people have had their say. The one thing about the plebiscite into same-sex marriage is that every Australian who wanted to express a view got to express a view. And, and if you were on the losing side of the argument at the end, you felt you had to go with the majority of Australians who wanted to vote yes. And I think that's been part of the reason, the fact that people have had their say, that the decision has been relatively well accepted. We've all moved on. We've left that debate, that fight behind us. There's been no real repa charge. And I can't see that there would be a repa charge. On the issue of abortion here in New South Wales, it comes on the back of decriminalisation also in Victoria, it's been sprung on people. They haven't had a chance to ventilate mm -hmm. their views at the ballot box. Now, if the Premier thinks it's a good idea, and she said that, she also said at the same time she hadn't read the legislation, <laughs> and I think it's incumbent on the government to draft the legislation, to draft good, sound, carefully drafted legislation, not leave it to a radical independent off there on the green left side of politics, and to own it in a way that everyone feels like there's a steady process, if need be, um, have public forum meetings, not have this rebel and this fight that's now occurring outside of the parliament in Sydney where there's protesters, because people feel angry that they're not in there having their say and they didn't get a say in March. Peter, I think it's always a huge risk for any government, no matter which side of politics you sit on, if you, if you bring policy to the table after the election and don't actually let people know anything about it before you go to an election or, or it's not on their radar and then all of a sudden it's, it's something that's coming into play and there's going to be a massive change that they were previously unaware of. I think if, you, if you're actually open and honest with people and, you, and you're really open and honest and have those processes in place where you communicate with, with those in your electorate, they're much more on board um, with, with what you're actually bringing forward. I don't know that that would be the case um, with this situation when it comes to uh, the abortion. I'm not totally across the issue. I did hear a little bit uh, from your show earlier and I heard that there was a scenario um, where a couple had chosen to, to terminate their baby in, I believe in, in the very late stages of that pregnancy due to the, the sex of the child, that made me feel really very uncomfortable and um, really quite sad to think that, that people were choosing whether to have a child or not based on the sex of that child. Yeah, and as I said to, to Rowan Dean, Luke, you know, mm. feminists have marched in the streets about countries overseas, India and China, two particular countries where uh, the rate of female abortion of the, of the female child is really high for no other crime than yeah. the poor little ones, uh, you know, likely to be born, born female. Um, that's, that's, I think that's the real worry. I think people feel that yeah. this stuff is not well thought through and that we should avoid the pitfalls where we can. Yeah. I think no one wants to go back to, to um, times past, you know, backyard abortions and things like that. Um, we have a very educated female population Anyone who wants contraception in this country can reasonably afford it Indeed. and reasonably access it. Yeah. And I also have to say, I said it tonight, I'll say it again, I think as a country we have to say 80,000 abortions per annum in the first world like Australia mm. is too high. Yeah. I read your excellent piece on the weekend too, by the way, and, and as someone that wasn't initially connected with this debate, I got a lot from that. I got a lot from Tanya Davies this morning as well and from listeners who make the same point. Uh, yes, we are, and, and again, without making the, the debate too simple or one-dimensional, was this, was this an issue that, I don't want to say it again, but I will, the quiet Australians were banging down the door of their local MP to get sorted out? You know, got to do it this week. Uh, yes, we need protests outside the parliament. This has got to happen. We can chew gum, change step at the same time. I get all that. But um, I, I just... I don't understand the thinking of the New South Wales government. Uh, I, I can imagine that if it were a different debate and we had a... Uh, thank God he's not middle-aged. A young Caucasian male leading the debate. I mean, exactly typical like mansplaining. How does, how does that work? If it had been a conservative bloke... Can you imagine? up legislation like yeah. this... Yeah. Yes, we, we sisters would have all said he's yeah. mansplaining. Exactly. He's mansplaining. Exactly. But he's got away with this. Well done him, but... It, it, it's bizarre. It, it, you get... You know what? As someone who just is a voter, moi, 
you want to, you really do want to like, you want to hope that your people you elect do well. And then you cosy up and think, oh, well, we've got a good one here. Then just they go, oh, no, what the hell are you doing? Yeah. I guess we can't expect perfection from a leader, but if this went through a process, and I think that's where we all agree, if there was at least a process, a bit more time, yep. uh, if the electorate could say, when I go in to vote today, I'm deciding about a lot of things, including this, which is important to me, then fair enough, bring it on, sister. But uh, that didn't happen. No, they didn't. Disappointing, very disappointing.